good afternoon everyone uh, on behalf of the center for brain research at the indian institute of science uh, i would like to wish you all very cordially uh, a very warm welcome this afternoon uh, to this grand uh, uh, lecture which is going to be given by professor george davis smith uh, and under the mrs sharwari gokhale memorial lecture uh, first of all let's uh, welcome professor george davis smith to the dais We have been having the very prestigious Mrs. Sharwari Gokhale Memorial Lecture uh, for the last five years, and uh, to introduce uh, Mrs. Sharwari Gokhale, uh, she was the first woman collector of the Mumbai city. Uh, so she was an Indian administrative officer, and when she superannuated. Uh, she was the additional chief secretary of uh, the department of uh, environment after 36 years of distinguished service in indian administrative uh, uh, system um when she passed before she passed away in january 2016 in an admirable gesture of payback and service to the society uh, she bequeathed her property to the center for brain research and uh, she wanted this money to be used uh, for neuroscience research at cbr and uh, in the nation uh, so ever since that we have had four lectures in this series the first of these lectures was given by professor steven hyman uh, director of stanley center for psychiatric research at the broad institute of mit and harvard university the second lecture was given by professor gullapalli yan ra uh, director of the lv prasad i institute the third lecture was given by professor k shrinath reddy former president of the public health foundation of india and the fourth lecture which was last year was given by dr avindranath uh, who is the clinical director National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke at the National Institutes of Health. So this is going to be the fifth uh, in the series of Mrs. Sharwari Gokhale Memorial Lecture. Professor George Davis Smith does not need an introduction. However, uh, for the sake of formality, I will have to say some things about uh, Professor Smith. Uh, he is a clinical. epidemiologist who has focused on methods for improving causal inference in studies of disease etiology and disease prevention uh, he is currently a professor of clinical epidemiology at the university of bristol since 1994 he is honorary professor of public health at the university of glasgow since 1996 He is visiting professor at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine since 1999. He was the scientific director of the Avon Longitudinal Study of Parents and Children. Uh, he was former editor in chief of the International Journal of Epidemiology. Uh, he is a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh and a fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences, United Kingdom. And his work has basically involved. early implementation of negative controls in epidemiological studies the use of cross context comparisons sensitivity analysis unobtrusive data collection methods and randomized trials in thought to be difficult situations these are all his pioneering contributions in fact these are all his landmark uh, contributions um throughout his career he has promoted increasing the accessibility of data and implemented this in all the studies that he has led which is something very remarkable including the avon longitudinal study of parents and their children i was just looking at uh, google scholar 10 minutes back he has accumulated 
three lakh ninety four thousand five hundred citations. Here the H index of two hundred and eighty four. He has an I ten index of I ten index of thousand seven hundred and eighty five, and his highest cited paper is cited forty six thousand eight hundred and twenty seven times. So he does not need any more introduction. Over to Professor George Davy Smith for your lecture. Thank you. Thanks very much. I always get nervous when I'm being introduced, and I realise I was pressing the button on, <laughs> and I was advancing the slides in desperation. Uh, it is such an honour to be, have been invited here to give the uh, Shwari Gakali Memorial Lecture, and thank you for that really generous introduction. And it's a particular honour to follow uh, from four such distinguished uh, previous lecturers. Uh, I'm going to talk about the triangulation of evidence in uh, etiological uh, epidemiologist, and the, the, this is the area I work on. So this is how to, to use epidemiological data to actually say th something about causality, about which factors actually cause uh, health differentials. And it might be, oh God, sorry, um, I didn't put the mic on, that's terrible. <laughs> I just, no, it wasn't. Oh. Well, we can hear you, Josh. Okay. <laughs> well, you can hear me. You'd be able to hear me even better now. But you could hear me anyway. That's, that's a relief. But now you can hear me better. Maybe you don't want to hear me better. So it's not. If you vote, if, vote for me to turn it off, I'll turn the mic, uh, I'll turn the mic off. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm just going to start to say, uh, when you're doing epidemiological studies, why would you need... A triangulation of evidence. We all know that the best approaches in uh, observational epidemiology is to have a large cohort study where you measure everything repeatedly as often as you can on a large number of people and you follow up them up and you find out whether they get a disease or not and you relate the exposures to disease. You statistically adjust for all the possible confounding factors or factors that would introduce bias so why would you want to move to a, a different methodology, which I will uh, try to uh, explain in this lecture? But I'll first talk about why you would want to think about uh, triangulation uh, of uh, evidence. And the, the reason I'm going, to, I'm going to go back in time to 1993, which is before most of you were born, but these, these were two studies which totally changed my career when they, when they were published. These were, these were reports in the New England Journal of Medicine, you know, the most prestigious medical journal in the world, from two of the most well-known cohort studies, the Nurses' Health Study and the, uh, and the Health Professionals' Follow-Up Studies. The, f the first was a, st a study of a large number, 100,000 or so nurses or female nurses. The second was a study of a, a large number of male health professionals. And these studies did what I said in the introduction. They measured many, many things on, on a large number of people, and they followed them up and found out what happened to them. And they reported these two papers back to back in which vitamin E supplement use was recorded. Now, these were health professionals. They would record pretty well whether they were actually taking vitamin E supplements. And then they were followed up, and what their... Uh, incident coronary heart disease was recorded and then every co-variable you could think of that they'd measured, you know, smoking and blood pressure and whether they were on cholesterol lowering drugs and uh, physical activity levels were adjusted for. And what was found was that the people who reported taking vitamin E supplements just after all those adjustments had a, a robust 35% lower risk of coronary heart disease. And we all know that you're supposed to replicate findings. So the next paper in the same issue of the New England Journal of Medicine found the same in the health professionals. And these two, pa these two papers got Bill Clinton off his usual position as the lead story in the New York Times. The lead story was vitamin E greatly reduces risk of heart disease, studies suggest. So note the language, greatly reduces that is suggesting causality. That's suggesting that something is actually influencing heart disease. In these studies, in these studies they, look, they looked at the duration of use of vitamin E supplements, 
And already in two to four years, you were all, they were already seeing this 35% lower risk of coronary heart disease after you'd taken supplements for two to four years. Uh, people aren't stupid, so when these, um, these results were known, there was a big jump in the taking of supplements containing vitamin E in the US, and that jump was seen particularly in the participants of the studies. Here you see that it went from about 15%, uh, and after the studies were published, it went up very quickly to over 50% were taking supplements containing vitamin E in both of the, stu in both of the studies. Then the randomized trials were done. Now this is randomizing people to exactly the same exposure as you're measuring. That is getting the jar, putting the tablet in your hand, taking it, swallowing it. You can randomize people to taking the supplement or a placebo. And when you randomize people to taking the supplement or the placebo for up to 13 years, absolutely no effect on coronary heart disease. So this meant that you can get these very robust findings in observational studies that are completely spurious. As I say, people aren't stupid. <laughs> they stop taking <laughs> vitamin E supplements. Now let's, you can say, well, taking vitamin E supplements, what's wrong with that? You know, it's not, at least it's not killing them. But I mean, the thing is, if you're taking a supplement that you think is reducing your risk of coronary heart disease by 35%, you might be slightly less concerned about your smoking or about your diet otherwise, etc. So there could be detrimental effects. And clearly, just the news reports of, that these things get, and then people hear that it doesn't actually work, uh, discredits epidemiology. This was, a, this was a discrediting practice. Now... There was, uh, there's many other vitamins. One of them is beta-carotene. And this was presented in an abstract. Beta-carotene does just as well as vitamin E supplements. You saw the same results with beta-carotene. Now, it, it, just, just the ab, an abstract published. These papers never appeared in the, New, in the New England Journal of Medicine. But even with the abstract appearing, there was a leap in, in the proportion of people taking beta-carotene in both of the studies. Why didn't these papers appear in the New England Journal of Medicine and in the New York, on the New York Times? Because the trials came out before they published the, the, the observational studies. And the trials showed, if anything, detrimental effect of beta-carotene. So what you see there is the best done observational epidemiological studies can get seriously misleading answers which have consequences. And the same thing was repeated for selenium and prostate cancer, hormone replacement therapy and coronary heart disease, vitamin C and both cancer and cardiovascular disease, folate and cardiovascular disease and cancer, etc., etc. So this was in, in, the early, in the early 90s, it was not a great time <laughs> to be an epidemiologist. And I actually gave up a PhD I was doing because I realized that it, just, it was going to just fall into this trap of, of not being actually, actually being able to establish causation. And I went and did things where causation was already known, like HIV and AIDS, doing prevention work on that, and childhood diarrheal disease in Nicaragua, etc. Now, now that, so, so what I'm, I'm using that to motivate this notion that just simply generating more and more data on similarly biased populations people in high-income countries and taking vitamin supplements. Of course it will replicate, because the confounding will be this in the same direction and will have the same influence. Here you see the, a little meta-analysis Matthias Egger and I did, uh, a systematic review of beta-carotene observational studies and then the trials on cardiovascular disease. The nurses' study and the health professionals don't appear because they never published the findings, but they showed the same They showed the same beneficial effect as the others did. And this is, a, I think, an extraordinary uh, paper. This reported a study in which 73 research teams were given the same data set. Now, this data set was a social science data set. I'm not going to go into the hypothesis. It doesn't actually matter for the interpretation. And they were told to go away and test the, uh, the same hypothesis with those data and then produce reports independently of each other. 73 teams report, produced reports independently of each other. And then one looked at the results in their reports. 
So these are arbitrarily defined by whether they got a statistically significant uh, finding. You know, the p-value less than 0.05. The use of the terminology statistical significance is banned in Bristol, and it should be banned everywhere. You shouldn't use these arbitrary uh, cutoffs, but that's another argument. But if you do use those arbitrary cutoffs, what you found was 25% of the, of the teams found a significant negative result, 17% a significant positive result. So more than 40% found a significant result, but in, <laughs> in an arbitrary direction. So, and that's just because they've got the same data set, but they're making different analytical choices. They'll adjust for different factors. They might, uh, they might you know, do a quadratic for some of the factors they're adjusting for. They might log something, etc. They'll transform the variables differently. And you get very different, you can get very different findings from the same observational data set. So what's important, not just the volume of data, what is important is having different methods where every method can be biased. Every method. A randomized controlled trial can lead to biased findings because people might informatively non-comply. Those who don't actually like taking the active drug will stop taking it. And, and maybe those people will be different from other people and that will distort your answer. You can get biased findings from randomized controlled trials, but the biases that would influence a randomized controlled trial would not be the same as the biases that would influence an observational epidemiological study. Those, the biases would be orthogonal. So the evidence from the two sources would actually add to the evidence. It would actually strengthen your inference, unlike merely piling up higher and higher and higher piles of data collected in the same circumstances. So you need to make, have reasoning about whether the direction and magnitude of biases across the study design are likely to be orthogonal, are likely to be not related. And establishing mechanisms linking your exposure and your outcomes can be important. And uh, a side issue is quantification. Add, it can add to evidence, but it's not essential. Many causal inferences in, um, in medicine going back in time were made without quantification. So I'm going to move on now to cover a few uh, different approaches which can provide a variety of evidence in etiological epidemiology. And you should remember this, equ this equation whenever looking at an observational epidemiological study that the, the assumptions for obtaining causal estimates in observational data is that there is no unmeasured confounding, i.e. there's no factors that you've not measured, and that there's no measurement error. And the, no unmeasured confounding and no measurement error means you're not looking at epidemiological data. That's an important equation to remember. So the first approach I'm going to talk about are cross-context comparisons. This is where you go out and you deliberately choose different contexts where the biases or the confounding will be different. It was, it was mentioned in the very over-generous introduction that I was, for a while, I directed the Avon Longitudinal Study of parents and children. This is a birth cohort around 1991, 1992. 13,000 pregnant women around Bristol were recruited and then they were followed up. Their children were followed up. Their partners were followed up. The, the children have been seen 60 or 70 times. That they're, they're, We're now recruiting the grandchildren, etc. So an incredibly detailed cohort study which allows you to adjust as well as anyone ever can for confounding factors. Now, in Alsbach, set up in a high-income country, breastfeeding relates to everything good. Breastfeeding in the baby, having been breastfed as a baby, relates to everything positive. Lower risk of infections, which is probably true, but also less, lower levels of obesity, of obesity in the children, lower blood pressure, greater respiratory function and cognition, everything good. Indeed, it predicts the, the cost and size of the Christmas present the children got. And if, and if you did the same sort of observational analyses, adjusting for all the confounders, it would look like being breastfed caused you to get bigger Christmas presents. And of course, the reason for that is that the better off families, higher levels of education, higher incomes, etc., breastfed more, and the children got larger Christmas presents. 
So uh, a colleague, Richard Martin, was involved in a whole series of meta-analyses, piling up data upon data upon data, and all of these things replicated, like being breastfed was related to lower obesity, lower blood pressure, etc. But they were all higher income country studies. So we went to uh, Pelotas in the south of Brazil, where my friend and colleague Cesar Victoria set up a birth cohort in 1982. And in that birth cohort, breastfeeding was not related to social position in the way it was uh, in Alsbach. And this is the work of Mary Jo Brian, who spent a year in Pilotus uh, carrying out this work. This is just to show that there are huge differences uh, in the social patterning in Alsbach. Breastfeeding is patterned the better off, uh, the more favourable uh, groups uh, uh, breastfed more. In Pilotus, no relationship. So the confounding structure would be different. So, so, so in, in this situation, you wouldn't expect the confounding to generate the same the associations in the same direction. And indeed, what we found was that in Pilotus, you did not see these, see these apparently beneficial effects on blood pressure or body mass index childhood obesity, although you did see it for uh, cognitive ability. And uh, Pilotus was relatively small, study, but there was a consortium of uh, birth cohorts in, in uh, low and middle income countries that came together and in that consortium you could see that you could get, you found heterogeneous results compared to Alsbach. So this distinction suggests that the, the associations seen in Alsbach are not c- causal, are not biological, they are due to confounding. And um, a randomized controlled trial, the only one that has been done so far, and I think the only one that will probably ever be done, which on breastfeeding, was set up by Mike, uh, Michael Kramer in Belarus, which was the place which had the lowest breastfeeding rates at the time he set the study up, 4% breastfeeding rates. Ever. Uh, uh, and um, uh, it, in Belarus, they, they cluster randomized, they randomized hospitals to either have breastfeeding promotion or not non-promotion. Promotion increased breastfeeding uh, results at a, at a certain number of weeks, I think three months, from 4% to 30-odd percent. So a big influence on breastfeeding. And what you saw there is by randomization in the Belarus study, there was no effect on blood pressure or BMI in, in agreement with the lack of Agreement in agreement with the lack of agreement, sorry, terrible English, uh, uh, between the uh, results from Alsbach and Pilotus. But they did find uh, a, a higher cogn- improved cognitive function in the kids randomised to a hospital where breastfeeding was promoted. So there you're seeing sort of three, le- three levels of evidence. You have the conventional observational study. You deliberately go to a context where the confounding will be different. And you have randomized evidence to put together to, uh, to triangulate um, uh, this question. So context doesn't need to be place. You, a, a different context can also be the same place at a different time when things have changed. And these, I have to admit, are some of my favorite epidemiological data. This relates to fried food consumption. So fried food consumption in high income countries these days is a marker of social deprivation. People are eating more and more fried food and unsurprisingly it relates to higher rates of everything bad, every bad health outcome. And in the nurses study and the health professional study indeed they show that but they're protected, they haven't done the randomised trials uh, of fried food. But you can go back in time to a different context than the US when fried food was patterned in a different direction because fried food was steak you fry steak a lot and and Hammond and Horn when they set up their massive study in the 1950s of smoking they measured fried food consumption I love this fried food you could look at non one to two times a week right the way up to 15 plus that means more than breakfast more than dinner and a dinner and lunch, you're having a sort of fried breakfast as well. So the, the, and what you see is you just can't eat too much fried food for your mortality. The more and more fried food you're eating, the lower and lower your risk of dying. Now, I don't think fried food is good for you, 
It's just that at this time, it was confounded in the opposite direction to how it is today. Again, uh, and might be different fried food, but, but again, just showing the context doesn't have to be, doesn't have to be placed. So I mentioned the, how breastfeeding related to size of Christmas present. Now what you would call size of Christmas present is a negative control outcome. Well, that's what it's called today. So it is an outcome which is not, cannot plausibly be caused by your exposure, but would be confounded in the same way as your exposure by socioeconomic position, health behaviours, etc., etc. So, so that's so that a negative control study. Now, the first, before that, actually, the term negative control was used years before in this context. I, the first study I did of this sort type was in 1992, published in The Lancet, and it was uh, on smoking and suicide, and it was actually titled Smoking as Independent, in inverted commas, Risk Factor for Suicide, Illustration of an Artifact from Observational Epidemiology. So that's the, the title sort of tells you what it was going to show. But uh, in that, we, we looked at uh, the smoking and suicide, and in a, th- a study of a third of a million men in the US, we could uh, replicate the observational effect. But in, but in this situation, you can think of a particularly insidious form of, conf- of confounding, which is reverse causation, which is when the disease process influences your exposure. And then that, that, of course, means that your exposure will relate positively to the outcome. So if people are depressed, they find it hard to give, up, to give up smoking. And some people who are depressed will self-medicate by smoking. So as well as all the conventional confounding that we can imagine, there will also be that added, um, uh, added element of reverse causation generating the associations. So in the US, a, a non-plausible negative control that could be used for this would be homicide. There were enough homicides, people being, who were murdered, to show that, yes, smoking predicted your risk of dying by being murdered just as strongly as it did of dying of suicide. And now the only plausible causal explanation for smoking and homicide is that the paramilitary wing of the health education and health promotion movement are shooting smokers as the ultimate deterrent Otherwise, I can't think of any other plausible mechanism. So these are negative control outcomes that can be used. You can also use negative control exposures. And, oh, well, I've got one other. I'll skip it. It's ultra-processed food also relates to dying of accidental and violent deaths. But I'll move on to negative control exposures. A negative control exposure is, as the name suggests, an exposure which will be confounded in the same way as your exposure of interest, but is not plausibly influencing the the outcome. So let's consider intrauterine effects of maternal uh, behaviours. Now, you have a good negative control, of course, because you have the dad. Now, what the dad does is not going to have the same influence on the intrauterine environment. And so in a, in a causal situation, one where we sort of know the answer, which is that <clears throat> mum's smoking uh, when pregnant, that leads to lower birth weight uh, of offspring. If you look at the dads, the dads, of course, will share the, all the same confounding family-level confounding factors. And after, you, after you take into account assortative mating by smoking, the father's smoking does not relate to Birth weight, of off, birth, birth weight of the offspring. And the father's smoking will not be having the intuterine effect. But maternal smoking is a bit like the inverse of breastfeeding. Maternal smoking is related to every bad outcome in the kids, including childhood obesity. And in that case, the father's smoking seems to have pretty similar association <clears throat> with that outcome, as does the mother's smoking which casts some doubt on the causal intrauterine effect uh, of, of, uh, of the smoking. And the same has been shown <coughs> for attention deficit disorder, where um, mother's smoking relates to higher attention deficit disorder in the children, but so does father's smoking. And you can show that the genetic 
scores for attention deficit in both the mothers and the fathers relates to whether they smoke, unsurprisingly. And so if the, if, if the mother smokes, the child also is going to get a, a larger dose of genetic variants that relate to attention deficit. And my uh, a good friend, Anita Thapper, did one of the most beautiful studies in this area, which was with uh, surrogate, uh, surrogate pregnancies. When you have both the biological mother who provides the ova, which beco- becomes the embryo, the bio- or the mother who carries the embryo. Now, the mother who carries the embryo can smoke like crazy. No effect on tension deficit in the offspring. The biological mother, her smoking, even though she's not carrying the, carrying the baby, it's her smoking that relates to the attention deficit in the offspring, presumably because of the, gene- the genetic confounding that I mentioned. I think that's what one of the most beautiful uh, studies, study designs that I know. So those are negative controls. If you're doing family level uh, factors that might have family level influence, you can do within sibship studies where you're then matching on those family level influences by not just taking cases and random controls or cohort with random uh, others. You actually just do all your analyses uh, are within sibships. They're matched for that. A different approach to uh, dealing with confounding is to take external perturbators of exposure. But when those external perturbators themselves can't influence or can't plausibly influence your outcome. So those perturbators will change your exposure but can't have any effect on your outcome. So if the perturbators do relate to the outcome then it's likely to be through the exposure. And an example of such a a perturbator is someone's age. Now, in the guidelines for getting coronary artery bypass grafting after, your, after you go to the emergency room, the A&E, with a, with a uh, heart attack or, or crescendo angina, uh, is age. And in the guidelines in the US, 80 is the sort of cut-off age when beforehand you would, t- you would want to sort of, uh, do an emergency coronary artery bypass graft, but because there's worries about, um, about uh, detrimental effects of the actual surgery uh, after 80 you can, you, you're more uh, taciturn about it so that's, that gives, and that gives us a regression continuity so I'll need to talk quite slowly through this because it's quite complicated but what, but what you see is this is absolutely ingenious study looked at, looked at people in, their, in different age groups and then whether or not they got a coronary artery bypass graft when they went into casualty and looked at their age and looked at two weeks before their birthday, if they were, if they were 76 and 50 weeks, and then two weeks after, if they were 77 and two weeks. There's no difference in age, essentially, but some of them are 76, some of them are 77. And then magically, around the age of 80, what happens is, if you're two weeks before your birthday, you're, much more, you're more likely to get the coronary artery bypass graft than if you're two weeks after. So if you just happen to have crossed the boundary of 80. Now, there's no way that that, could, that that two weeks can have this magical effect on your outcome. But sure enough, let's just look at the, the, the relevant group. The ones uh, who were 79 and 50 weeks had lower mortality than the ones who were uh, 80 in two weeks. And the most likely explanation for that is that this group are getting more coronary artery bypass grafts. So the lesson to learn, firstly, is that this this is how regression discontinuity um, works uh, in terms of causal inference. The second thing, and I'm pretty sure I'm the oldest person in this room, so it'll only apply to me, is that when you get admitted with chest pain, just be 79 forever. If you're in the US, whatever happens... 79, honestly, gov. Now, another method of using something similar to this, a regression discontinuity design can be thought of as a type of instrumental variable design. So an instrumental variable is something that influences your exposure or is associated with your exposure but has no plausible effect on your outcome except through the exposure. That's an an instrumental variable. 
And you can use genetic variants in that way uh, in an approach uh, which is called uh, Mendelian randomization. And uh, I don't know how to... If so, I can't... Oh, yep. Which is going to be explained here. Epidemiologists are interested in understanding factors related to health and disease. Do smokers tend to die younger than non-smokers? It certainly looks that way. But disentangling cause and effect can be difficult. Smokers are different, on average, from non-smokers. They're more likely to drink heavily and have less healthy diets. But even if we measure these confounding factors, we may not measure them perfectly. Or there may be others that we haven't measured. Also, as people become ill, they may cut down or give up smoking which could wrongly suggest that reduced smoking leads to worse health. We could randomly assign 50,000 people to smoke and 50,000 people to not smoke and follow them up to monitor their health. This removes the possibility that any other factor could be responsible for any differences we see in their long-term health. But this is neither ethical nor practical. Fortunately, we have all been recruited into an experiment without knowing it at the point at which we were conceived. Our genes, which have passed on randomly from generation to generation, influence how much we eat, sleep, drink, smoke and more. These genetic influences are not affected by anything else you may or may not choose to do in your life. They're not related to confounding factors. We can use this knowledge to learn about cause and effect, grouping people according to their genetic code. This method is called Mendelian randomization. For example, smokers who carry one version of a gene called CHRNA5 tend to smoke less heavily than those who carry a different version. When we group people according to which version of this gene they have, we find that the people with the version of the gene associated with heavier smoking do indeed die younger. But is the gene influencing how long we live in some other way? We don't think so. When we look at the same gene in non-smokers, there's no effect on life expectancy so the effect must be driven by smoking. Using this method, we can show that smoking causes lung cancer, heart and respiratory disease, and many other diseases, but does not seem to influence depression or anxiety. Mendelian randomization has already begun to tell us about factors that influence our risk of disease. Now we're using the same approach in other ways, to look at several risk factors together, and to look at what influences disease progression, which may help us to develop new treatments. Uh, I've, I've devoted the last 20 years of my life to Mendelian randomization, and the two hours is the shortest possible period I can take to explain it. So this is a, a two-minute animation, uh, and, um, uh, which I can't move on from. Do you know how, how I move on? And uh, um, uh, what I'd like you to do is, uh, when you go home, is watch it again. When you want to, uh, um, indeed, whenever you're on a computer which has a different IP address, watch it again. Because with a few more views, I will hit the magic 100,000 views, and then I get a penny from YouTube, and that's my first step to becoming a YouTube billionaire and YouTube influencer. So please watch it everywhere you can, but it has to have a new IP address. It's not worth watching it twice on the same computer. Tell all your friends to watch it. Thank you. So, uh, so that's Mendelian randomization. You're using the genes to tell you about the, the environmental factors that mimic the genetic effect on the exposure. Uh, you, you can use Mendelian randomization principles also to estimate confounding. When, when you see that there's very strong confounding, you might, you, if you could understand what is confounding those associations, you'd learn a lot about... <laughs> the disease causes because the confounders have to be causes of the disease. So you can, you can apply the Mendelian randomization principles to understand confounding. And now here's an example where we were looking at small HDL particles and small HDL particles strongly predict, this is me measured five years, ten years before you get sepsis, your, your level of small HDL particles really, really strongly predicts whether you die of sepsis. Now, if this was a cause, we can, we can modify it. You can, we can raise your small HDL particles. If this is a cause, it would be important. But the Mendelian randomization, taking genetic variants that relate to the small HDL particle number, and they are such, suggests that it is not causal. So you, could, so you could then leave, the, leave that there, but then you could say, but what is generating that really strong observational association? 
And one fa the factor that seems to be generating it to quite a large extent is the interleukin-6 activity. Now, interleukin-6 became famous, IL-6 became famous during COVID because IL-6 receptor blockade with uh, tocilizumab reduced mortality during COVID in people with COVID. And IL-6 uh, receptor bl bl blockade we think would reduce sepsis because the, the same Mendelian randomization studies before the trials were done, Mendelian randomization studies suggested IL-6 blockade would indeed be beneficial in COVID and IL-6 receptor blockade looks like it would be beneficial in sepsis because the MR shows that it has, both a, it has a strong effect on sepsis mortality but also it lowers your HDL, your small, dent, your small HDL particle number. So actually understanding what is driving the confounding can be important. But you can, you can use these principles to actually, under, to un, actually understand if factors are, com, are confounding factors, even when you haven't got the, the individual level data on the confounders, because you can use you know, genetic variants that relate, you know relate to the exposure. You don't have to have measured the exposure in people, which is a rather wonderful, uh, wonderful thing. There's also non-genetic IVs. I talked about the regression displacement with the cabbage, with coronary artery bypass grafts for something like smoking and you know, birth weight of offspring, say. You can study it with the instrumental variables you can use for that are like taxation levels which change over time within states in the US and they change between states. And those IVs have been used and by look at then looking at how they, those changes in taxation for smoking relate to birth weight of offspring. And they do indeed uh, support the notion that smoking by mums lowers birth weight of offspring. And of course you can do randomised controlled trials. Randomization can be thought of as a form of an instrument where the, 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 the randomization, the fact of randomization is the instrumental variable. Now for maternal smoking in pregnancy and birth weight of offspring, Nearly all of these methods have been applied. Many of the methods have been applied, and they all show the same thing. They all triangulate uh, on, on showing that the maternal smoking in pregnancy does lower birth weight of uh, offspring. Now, this is just a, this is just a section of the a selection of the methods that can be used. Uh, at the end, I'll put some further reading, which goes through many more so many more approaches. But the basic principle is that there will be an independence of bias. So, as I say, imagine a randomized controlled trial of a cholesterol-lowering drug or an observation, or, or a, a observational study or Mendelian randomization using genetic variants in the genes influenced by the drugs. All of them can be biased, but the biases in one would not predict the biases in the other. So you need... So you, having good reasoning that the biases will be independent is important. Ideally, triangulation of evidence in the ideal world, what you would do is you would do a systematic review or systematic overview of, data, of the evidence coming from all the different sources rather than just cherry pick the, you know, one study in each area that you like which go in the same way. And in some situations, you can even quantitatively synthesize evidence from different approaches but you have to think very carefully about what is my study design actually estimating. And I'll give an example of that by comparing Mendelian randomization of, of lowering uh, LDL cholesterol or non-HDL cholesterol or bad cholesterol, you can think of it as, which you can either do in randomized controlled trials or in Mendelian randomization studies. Now, the Mendelian randomization studies perfectly match the trials because your trials are, will be of statins, which are HMG co-reductase inhibitors, or Mendelian randomization studies using genetic variants in the HMG CoA gene that relate to cholesterol level. And you have this four such pairings, this PCSK9 inhibitors and the genetic variants in PCSK9, statins, as I've talked about, azetamide and neiman pick c one like one uh, which is a genetic variant that relates to cholesterol uh, uptake across the gut, in some ways possibly mimicking dietary cholesterol, uh, or another uh, CETP inhibitors and C CETP inhibition and the CETP gene. And these, these, these results match up rather beautifully from the trials in the MR, 
And these are meta-analyses of trials, by the way. Um, but what you see is the drug trials show about 35 to 40% of the effect that you predict from the Mendelian randomization studies. Now, this is absolutely what you would expect because your genetic variants relate to your cholesterol level from birth. And atherosclerosis starts early when U.S. soldiers in the Korean War average age by deaths were 18 or 19, 19 I think was the, was the peak, de- peak age. Uh, if they were autopsied, they already had atherosclerosis. You know, it's developing across life. And so giving people tablets at age 60, you wouldn't expect that to miraculously reverse this long cumulative disease of the arteries. And, but, but you do get, in fa- five years of treatment, you get about 40%. But you could sort of scale these and meta-analyze these sort of scaled associations. So uh, we, we, you, I've, I've already talked about some approaches to some situations of combining methods, just a couple more very quickly. Uh, one is combining Mendelian randomization and regression discontinuity analysis. The reason I waited till quite a way through the talk before I showed the video is otherwise I would have just talked about Mendelian randomization, which I didn't want to do. But if you invite me back, I'm very happy to do a two-hour talk on Mendelian randomization, but I'll, I'll skip that. And so here you have a beautiful regression discontinuity because in the UK, and this UK Biobank has half a million people in it, I'm one of the participants. In the UK, they changed the law sometime in the early 1970s that children... Uh, used to be able, could leave school at 15, and then the minimum school leaving age became 16. So that led to, uh, just across a year, that led to this jump in the average number of years of schooling that people got by, by quite a few months, because a lot of kids who would have left school at 15 stayed on to 16. Some of those found out that school wasn't so terrible and stayed on to A-levels and university, etc. So it changed it, t- it changed people's trajectories in terms of years of education. And so w- you can also do Mendelian randomization because there are genetic variants that re- relate to the number of years of education people uh, obtain. And those genetic variants relate to that between siblings. So th- that is not due to family level confounding. Although there is a family level effect, you actually get smaller estimates uh, you get, uh, between, between siblings. Um, so what you see uh, is that the, uh, the Mendelian randomization and the regression discontinuity point in the same direction uh, uh, with lower mortality, better health outcomes. They show larger effects than the observational associations. and That's partly because, or probably because, instrumental variables re- correct for measurement error. Uh, like with you know, your cholesterol level, a single measurement at age 50 is not a very good measure of your cholesterol from birth, but the genetic variants are very good measures of your, of your cholesterol from birth. So you are correcting for measurement error. Now, if anyone had told me, who happened to be born just too late to leave school at 15, but I experienced what it was like by being with the um, place where people were forced to stay on, if anyone had told me at that time that it was going to be good for anyone, either for the people staying on or for anyone else, I would have said that was impossible to believe because I, I thought the only reason that the, that, that the kids who stayed on stayed on was so they could just beat me up more often. Uh, the idea that, but, but actually, it clearly had an, it, it, it changed people's life courses. And I'm going to skip that because I'm running out of time. So, of course, there's other forms of evidence beyond the quantitative evidence, as I hinted at the beginning. I mean, when you're doing biological sciences, you think, well, you know, reasoning from biology should be part of the evidence. Now, that is true. But the problem is uh, that for virtually any hypothesis you have, whether it points in one direction or the other, if you Google, you can find some mechanism which plausibly... Uh, explains the association. And I mentioned that I was working on H- I first came to India in 1992 working on uh, HIV uh, AIDS prevention. So in 1991 uh, I was uh, very interested in this area and in the London School of Hygiene Library I, which I used to spend a lot of my life in 
I, w and I went in and uh, I opened the current journal of infectious disease. There was a study on cofactors in male to female sexual transmission of HIV. And in this study, all, they were looking, the question was, what's the effect of oral contraceptive use? And uh, they found that oral contraceptive use increases the risk of future HIV infection. And the argument was that the oral contraceptive had a direct effect on the genital mucosa, making it a less successful barrier to HIV, and had an immunosuppressive action which would increase susceptibility to HIV. Both of those sound, that's biology, science. Both of those sound implausible. I put that journal down and I literally opened the next, <laughs> the next journal in the pile, Annals of Internal Medicine. These are good journals. And there was a study on man-to-woman sexual transmission of HIV. And they found that the oral contraceptive use protected, apparently protected against HIV. And they said progesterone-containing oral contraceptives thickened cervical mucus, which might be expected to hamper the entry of HIV into the uterine cavity. That sounds plausible, doesn't it? So, I mean, now the, now it, in, in these days when I was teaching at the School of Hygiene, when, when people had to go to the library, and I, I used to assign an exercise where the group would divide them up into two groups, and one group had to go and find evidence, you know, biological evidence to support things in one direction, and the other group, the other direction. It would take quite a while. It was a sort of exercise you could actually give to people for an afternoon, and you could go and have a cup of tea. Now, of course, with Google, it would take you about five minutes to find the evidence, but, uh, but it's still a useful, um, a useful exercise. Then, but, but, of course, you do think that, that, that this, this evidence should be useful. But, but as I say, just saying that in the discussion of a paper, people have to dis discuss this evidence, the bio the sort of evidence, it's not useful because you can just find things to, to support whatever you show. So there, there is one method which really hasn't, has been used very little in epidemiology, has been used in climate science and some other areas that I think deserves more investigation. And that is that when you're planning a study or planning to triangulate evidence on a question, you actually take a group of disinterested scientists, i.e. people who aren't committed to one direction or the other from the biological sciences who aren't epidemiologists, and you, and you elicit their priors on what sorts of mechanisms might actually be plausible. But you do that in advance. You do, and, you, and you use that evidence that you find through that process, whatever your results show. But difficult to do. So, moving towards the end, you'll be uh, pleased to hear. I, I, I'd, I'd like to suggest that triangulation of evidence is so, somewhat like solving a crossword puzzle. And the reason it's uh, like solving a, a, a crossword puzzle is because it is a sort of framework where sometimes things that don't directly intersect with your question, they're, they're not directly intersecting with your question, but they provide supporting evidence for the scaffolding. They provide supportive evidence for, for the frameworks that you're using for, for, to, an to answer the question. So uh, let's take this crossword, say that convoluted comes up, and you look, uh, you look up that seven across, and you look up in the thesaurus, and it can be involved, confused, puzzling, tortuous, involute, baffling. So you can't put in anything for um, convoluted. But then one across you've got is A and O, for instance, five and five. Anyone got any ideas? Think medical? Blood groups, perfect. So it's blood group or blood types. But, but you, let's put in blood group in. Let's pencil blood group in. And then let's consider nine across. Gangster's girlfriend. Someone said it. I'm sure. Shout it out. I, I thought someone said. I thought someone said mall. It's mall. If you, if you ruin your life, if you've spent so much time watching 50s film noir, then you would know that off by heart. And this is one that the only person in the room who might know it, I would imagine, is uh, Caroline, is one down Beesum from slightly the south and, and uh, west of where you come from. So it's an English word which means broom. If you know it, you know it. You know that a Beesum is a broom. Uh, 
So now, so these these don't intersect directly with with our um, uh, with our uh, answer, but these these then provide support for Broom. They they provide this framework tells you that that answer is now really rather strong. So that cuts down that cuts this down to confused or tortuous. And then you go to discharge of water, which is two down. I'd better go for it. Overflow. Now, outflow. God, it isn't overflow. That's shocking. <laughs> outflow. Uh, and anyway, that which, which then tells you that it is, it is, it's tortuous. So, so, so that's trying to get across this notion that it's evidence that actually supports the framework, which supports your belief in a question, in something which directly intersects with your question. Uh, provides evidence for that. I don't, th- I don't think there's many people here, I'm not sure if there are many people here, have done epi- formal epidemiology, but those who have will have come across Bradford Hill's viewpoints. Uh, and uh, triangulation is, uh, uh, overlaps very much with the Bradford Hill criteria, or oh, sorry, viewpoints, he, none of them are criteria. He was, he, was, he was straightforwardly clear about that. Uh, but does tr- tries to put it into a slightly more formal framework. For, for triangulation, I think it's essential, or it should be essential, that, the, the, that you pre-register your protocol of what sorts of evidence are you going to allow in, what sort of evidence is admissible for answering the question. And the reasons for doing that is to see what happens if there isn't any pre-registration. This is when the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute uh, uh, changed its rules and the uh, National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute said that every trial that, was, that, that it funded had to be registered and then had to report the results. They didn't have to, even if they didn't publish them formally in a paper, they had to report them. And what you see is before this was introduced, there were no adverse results. Things were either null, using this uh, band in Bristol t- to be avoided significant threshold or they were beneficial. <laughs> and then remarkably, this is a nice regression displacement, after registration was mandated, you, st- you started seeing adverse results being reported, huge numbers of nulls, and a rather smaller proportion of beneficial effects. So what registration means, means is you can't p-hack. So to p-hack is when you just you analyze your data again and again and again until you get some significant finding and then you publish that finding. Nor can you hark or hypothesize after the results are known. So you, so you, you p-hack, then you get the results, then you make a hypothesis and then you find the biologically plausible data uh, to support it. And uh, pre-registration would also do away with cognitive biases. Probably the, one of the most important components is that there should be open access data. All the data that you use should be available to others because if, they, uh, if others can actually analyze it and can then show different findings by doing different assumptions about data, about the data structure and the modeling, etc., uh, that is obviously giving severe testing to your hypothesis. And this is now nearly, this is uh, 29 years old. Uh, I wrote an editorial in the BMJ saying that they, they should increase the accessibility of data. Uh, and by, made, by the BMJ making it mandatory that when people submitted a, uh, a, a, a paper that they sent, the, they sent the data in, this shows what a fossil I am, says that papers submitted to journals had to be accompanied by a disk copy of the data. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't, isn't that sweet, eh? Uh, and that the fall in submissions to a journal brave enough to implement this policy would be a useful indicator of its success. Richard Smith was the editor of the BMJ at that time he, who asked me to write this editorial. He was a big supporter of this and uh, he took to his editorial board a proposal that they introduced it and the uh, vote at the editorial board was one, to, that was his vote, to 29. But now it is surprising, but now more and more journals are rightly saying that this should be the case. You should not, not only should you have your data, but you should have the code that you used to generate your findings should be open access. You pre-register a detailed protocol. Consensus then relates to what is admissible as evidence. People who are debating this, people who have priors that are very different on the results, would be brought together and should be then debating things about whether certain data are admissible to answer this question. Agree on that, 
Every, every, this, anyone can cheat. They could be gaming the system or parking. Pre-registration after the results are known. But that is, that is straightforward fraud. That's scientific malpractice. And uh, I'd just like to thank the Royal Society Yusuf Hamid Visiting Professorship Scheme, which is why I'm here. I'd like to thank... These are the people who did virtually all of the work uh, uh, that I've shown. Uh, if you're interested in Mendelian randomization and you'd, and you'd like the two-hour version, well, then this is, very, this is a long, recent review on Mendelian randomization. There's a conference in sunny Bristol... And Sanjay can, can tell, say that in Bristol in, in June it's always sunny, isn't it? Beautiful, beautiful. And if anyone's interested, it's going to be the uh, sixth international Mendelian randomization conference. Uh, and if you've got anyone that you know uh, uh, who you really don't like, but you've got to buy them a Christmas present, can I recommend this book uh, on uh, combining human genetics and causal inference to understand human disease and development? And that's 53 minutes, 55 seconds. Thank you very much. randomization studies, how do you look at the dose-response relationship? Like, it's one of the tenets of Bradford Hill criteria, right? Um, like, there is no way to determine the dosage of a gene, or is there any way? So, so you, how you can determine the dose-response uh, relationship, you can do it two ways. One which you should do, if you can. One which you should not do. <laughs> the way that you should do it, if you can, is... To, to, to take, take an exposure where the genetic variant relates to a, dif a very different level of the exposure in clearly identified groups. Now, the work, uh, a way that we've done this is uh, when looking at alcohol and cardiovascular disease, and we used uh, some data uh, from a, hu a huge biobank in China called the, uh, Kodori, the China Kodori Biobank. And uh, in China, uh, across China, there's huge differences in alcohol intake by areas. There, uh, there is also the fact that women hardly drink at all. Now, so, with, so uh, there's Muslim areas of China where virtually very few people are drinking. There's Shanghai where more are drinking, but everywhere women aren't drinking. So if you combine, if you combine gender and location... You get, such, you, get the, you get those areas where the genetic variant hardly relates to alcohol intake because no one's drinking. Mm -hmm. You get that group where mm -hmm. it hardly relates. Mm -hmm. And you get the group, the men in Shanghai, where it relates really strongly to alcohol intake. Yeah. So the variant, is, the variant is indeed associated with things from between near zero True. and a big difference. So you get a beautiful plot of, uh, of the dose-response relationship. You need to have situations where that can be done. You need to think carefully about that. The way not to do it is a mathematical approach called nonlinear Mendelian randomization. Uh, the current method for which is entirely spurious. And uh, uh, three days ago, you'll see the Lancet Diabetes and Endocrinology retracting a, a highly publicized nonlinear MR, which claimed to be able to show this big protection in one group. And, not entirely spurious and uh, retracted with a commentary by me uh, um, a few days ago. So don't do it. Don't, don't use nonlinear Mendelian randomization at present until the method's been tested more strongly. But do use interactions when you actually can use interactions. Thank you. Fantastic talk. Uh, my question is about uh, you know the current practices of genome-wide association studies, where you actually do a hypothesis screening 
you know, even yeah. when you're not aware of it, like uh, the cancer genome atlas and uh, yeah. repositories like that, and which have led to further analysis where you look at the entire genome and then you look at polymorphisms yeah. or the variants which are uh, at least correlated with a given disease. So what's your take on that? Now, would you put that as harking? <laughs> No, uh, no, because because you you, you're, you have a hypothesis which just happens to come from R. A. Fisher, who's a reasonable source of hypotheses, and Fisher in 1918 introduced the infinitesimal model, which was the model that there are a very very large number of tiny of small genetic effects on a trait, and he was thinking height was his model in 1918, and uh, in fact his. Uh, predecessor Galton had talked about that, had talked about how, how variation in how arched your foot is through to how pointed your head is and everything in between uh, where can, influence, uh, can influence your height. So you have a hypothesis that there are that, that your hypothesis is that genetic variants have, there's a lot of genetic variants which will, for common traits will largely have small effects. I mean there are some of course large effect variants but for nearly all phenotypes the large the proportion of the variance is explained by small variance. And that, that hypothesis tells you that uh, predicting you're going to get large effects for uh, some candidate gene, something because you, you think that that process is involved, is liable to be wrong. And of course they were spectacularly wrong. In the early the candidate gene uh, studies that appeared before genome-wide association studies, virtually all of them were spurious. So I'm, a, I'm, a big, I'm an enthusiast uh, for genome-wide association studies, but, but the genome-wide association study is only the first step, and one could say it's almost a sort of trivial step, actually you know, doing it once you have the data. It's the, the important thing then is thinking, what can you do with genome-wide association studies? And Mendelian randomization is one way that you can use the results of genome-wide association studies to tell you, to, to find out about modifiable exposures, to find out about phenotypes. Because the causation of genes has to be through phenotype. Genes don't have some magical effect on some outcome. It, maybe it's a phenotype that you don't measure, you know, some, you know, but they have to be working through a stream of phenotypes. So Mendelian randomization is like natural selection, where natural selection uh, says that it's the phenotype which is selected for. The phenotype that means you have more offspring, whatever. It's not that the gene automatically leads to that without going through um, phenotype. And uh, one could indeed say that natural selection is a subcategory of Mendelian randomization, but that would obviously be... Uh, <laughs> be <laughs> possibly going too far. But the... the, the uh, MR, Mendelian randomization is actually being used in, in, in a non-human context, both in rice and some, uh, quite a lot of crops, and uh, you know, explicitly say we're using Mendelian randomization for finding out what the phenotypes are that are selected for when you're actually trying to select uh, for crops, and so it's, so it's, been, it's, it's expanded out into that, into that domain. So it was a wonderful talk. So I have one question, like, you know, uh, so you, like you mentioned about the variants. Uh, so like, do you have any bias in like selecting a genes for your randomization? Say, you no, know, like, should we link to it? No, should we like no known association between the particular gene and that yeah. particular disease? Or it can be any like, you know, uh, and two, when there are multiple small variants, like, like you said, you know, multiple small effects. Yeah. How do you take, uh, like, you know, uh, take care of all this? And then also, last question is yeah. like, do you also take in consideration if there any, like, you know, if there is any biological evidence for like associated with that particular variant and disease, or is it just like, you know, association like, like some epidemiological associations? So that's a really good and challenging question, uh, and it's one that I've changed my mind about over over the years. Um, I think. Uh, um, I think that when you, when you have knowledge of the biological activity of the gene, then that really strengthens your inference. So if you're if you're looking at alcohol, if you take variants in the acet acetaldehyde dehydrogenase variant, that you know why it relates to alcohol intake because it it leads to uh, flushing and palpitations and headache. Uh, if you if you if you have the null variant, 
Um, that, and that allows you to think that that is, you know, is, is perturbating alcohol in that way. It's not influencing alcohol through some other process. The problem with the expanding genome-wide association studies is that you'll start picking up genetic variants that influence a trait upstream of your trait of interest. So if you're interested in, say, C-reactive protein, then the, for C-reactive protein there is a cis promoter region variant which rather, rather, rather directly relates to higher CR, CRP levels. Once you get the GWAS, you stop FTO, a variant that's famously known to relate to higher body mass index, relates to CRP, but it relates to it through body mass index. And of course, body mass index will influence coronary heart disease, etc., not through CRP. So you bring in what are called heritable confounders. So the situation is, I think, that in situations is, is that you would, you would have an informative choice. If you're looking at a protein, you would take cis PQTLs, I variants that, that are in, actually close to the gene, might be working through the promoter, uh, etc. Um, possibly relate to, will, will relate to expression. If you're looking for, uh, for something like vitamin D, there's four canonical vitamin pathways involved in vitamin D metabolism, and you take variants in those pathways. Because in the vitamin D GWAS, if you take just everything from the GWAS, you get you get the CHRNA5 variant that I mentioned that relates to heaviness of smoking. Now that's not relating to vitamin D because of just straightforwardly, you know, he's, he's having a, the smoking is influencing your vitamin D levels. So, so, so you would get this heritable confounding problem. So, uh, so uh, you, you would, you would uh, want, when, when you can informatively select, you would informatively select. You might want to do as a sensitivity analysis just to sort of um, uh, uh, take all the variants, but then you would use these, you would use the methods which are detailed at excruciating length here. There's, many, there's now a whole stack of sensitivity analyses which are robust to there being some spurious variants, some um, inheritable confounding variants. In fact, there's a method by um, a close colleague of mine which is called the heritable confounder <laughs> um, uh, com control approach, which is in Nature Communications recently. So, um, yes, yeah, so, so, so there's lots of methods. If, if you just do the naive um, Put all, add, add up the effects of all the genes together, then you then you might get directed pleiotropy might might come through. But but at the very least, you you, you want to do sensitivity analyses, and and when you, and when you do have a, a gene of of known effect, um, then you um, uh, th then you apply that you apply that knowledge. Thank you. Excellent talk. Uh, these days, uh, causal inferencing, causa causal graphs, causal bandits, these are all very active research topics in machine learning. Mm. Um, so do they in any way advance the causal inferencing that you're talking about, or is it vice versa? So that's, a, <laughs> that's an equally, that's a very good question. Um, I mean, can you actually, you know, can you get hypothesis free causation, if you like. I mean, can you just get causation out by drawing directed acyclic graphs? Um, I mean, this was obviously introduced. Judea Pearl is a computer scientist who's a big promoter uh, of these approaches. I think that, you know, causal graphs on their own don't get you towards causality. They're incredibly useful for thinking about the structure of biases. I think it's impossible. It's very, it's very difficult to describe explain a bias like collider bias when you, can, when, you, when, when, you, when you condition on a factor which is caused by your exposure of interest but by other things and it leads and, and adjusting on it actually just leads to additional confounding, what looks like additional confounding. It's very difficult to explain those without causal graphs so I think they're, they're really, causal graphs are really good for explaining at a higher level and at a, at a transportable level how biases work but causal graphs in themselves don't mean you're going to get any closer to causality. You get closer to causality when you anchor, where well, there's some anchors in the causal graph which direct some of the arrows, which tell you that arrow has to be in that way. Like you can't have an arrow which changes your germline genome when you're 50. 
doesn't happen. You, what you've got on the germ line, you've already got. And then, and to, to, make, to make that very clear, is that um, DAGs, I mean, Pearl writes about, he writes incorrectly about Sewell Wright, but he, he says Sewell Wright's a hero, but he doesn't really know very much about Sewell Wright. But Sewell Wright introduced path diagrams in 1919, which are the, which, from which the, have, have the similar logic to uh, directed acyclic graphs. They just mean you have to encode when you really don't know the direction. You, ha you can use double-headed arrows, but, which aren't allowed in DAGs, but uh, if they're outside of where you're trying to inference from. But Wright was a geneticist. Sewell Wright was a geneticist. And he, his path diagrams were, were anchored by not by genotyped genetic variants, obviously that didn't exist, but by matings. You know, they, they were anchored by the genetics. And in fact, in, in, in his famous diagram, you, know, you might know the one with, with uh, um, Sewell Wright's diagram of guinea pigs, he was looking, he was looking at guinea pig um, uh, coat colour. In that diagram, one of the things is he often missed because it's such a beautiful handwritten drawing. He actually, he, he actually writes in it chance and he points at the, the sperm from the, from, you know, what, how, what leads the fertilization is by chance. It's random. So you're actually anchoring it on the, on, on, on the genetics, and the genetics are uh, given, by, given by chance. So if you've got anchors, if you, could, you, could, you, can, you can start applying machine learning, but, but, but you have to, tr you have to, you have to um, enhance that with there being some... Uh, orientating uh, uh, anchors, which which allow you to say these arrows are definitely in that direction. Okay. Uh, so, if not any more questions, I would like to thank uh, Professor thank George Davis Smith for this excellent, fascinating lecture. We have learned a lot today, and I think uh, I mean. Uh, his research, as our director also said, that it's, we don't need to introduce anymore, but uh, probably uh, it will encourage some of the younger scientific minds to carry out excellent clinical epidemiological research. And for people like me, Mendelian randomization and these things it's, are, are very close to my heart, and it was wonderful listening to you in person. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, we would also like to thank Dr. Uh, Prabdeep for helping us uh, with organizing this lecture today and of course to the institute authorities for this hall. I would like to request Professor Narahari for presenting Professor Smith with a memento oh, marking this occasion. Oh, that's amazing. That's, thank you. That is I honestly didn't, I was not anticipating this, I have to say. Thank you so much. That's lovely, that's lovely. Thank you so much. That's really kind. Thank, Thank you. you again. On behalf of CBR, we invite you all to high tea outside. Thank you. <laughs>